major event or trend is currency wars. This year, in just the last two weeks, since I've been presenting since January 1, for the last three weeks, you have Brazil and the Brazilian Minister of uh, whatever, Finance or Central Banker, warning of global currency wars where governments trying to lower the value of their currency so that they can make their economies or their export more competitive. Well, Russian government has warned about it. Japan has already done it. They, you know, just declared that they're going to lower uh, or devalue the yen. Americans are just doing it all the time. The British aren't behind. They just keep printing the money and keeping the... So, basically, we should be expecting a lot more currency problems, currency instability, and currency wars. And you got two more. Obamanomics. Well, what's Obamanomics? This is the economic policy of Obama, which is tax and spend. And now what Obama is doing, spending even more, of course they aren't shrinking in all government spending, and taxing even more. Well, spending more and taxing more is a recipe for what? Recipe for? This. Huh? This. Yeah, for disaster. Huh? For recession. Well, for way more than just the recession. <laughs> it's just a complete collapse. So, basically what it means it keeps the economy until it just crashes. Well, when it's going to crash? When the markets lose confidence in U.S. government bonds or lose confidence in the dollar. And the last one is... Abenomics. What the hell is Abenomics? Anyone? Any clue? No. Abenomics refers to the economic policy of Shinzo Abe. Who's Shinzo Abe? Who's Shinzo Abe? It's the new, just recently chosen, one or two weeks ago, Prime Minister of Japan. Yes, and this guy is saying, we are going to crash completely the yen, and they lowered, basically, with talk, it's called verbal communication, they've lowered the yen 15-20%, so the yen has completely crashed just recently, and his policies more government spending, more printing money. Basically, for 22 years, the Japanese economy is in stagnation and going down and going down, and the policy of the Japanese has been print more money, borrow, and spend. And for 22 years, this policy has completely failed. This is a policy which is proven failure. And now this guy is saying is, we will do a lot more of what we know has proven failure, and we're going to do a lot more. So, the Japanese economy has been a complete disaster, and now he's going to do a lot more to make it a bigger disaster. All right? So... Exactly when and how, we don't know. But that's what these guys are doing. These guys are insane. What is insanity? You know the definition of what insanity means? Craziness. Huh? It's craziness. It is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So, for 22 years, they do the same <laughs> policy. The same policy fails. And now they do more of the policy, and somehow, it's like drinking alcohol, expecting to get sober, and then they say, well, I gotta drink more, and more. Okay, well, okay. it doesn't work. All right, a few more to finish. Sorry, what's alternative to all of this? This is obviously something short-sighted. Yes, because po po politicians are short-sighted. Yes, of course. So what's the alternative? The alternative is, Austerity, cut spending, cut
cut government bureaucracy. Let's support Merkel. Huh? Let's support Merkel. Yes, yes, yes. That's the alternative. Well, the alternative is what I've been explaining so far all this presentation. The alternative is a complete collapse of the system, and then you rebuild it from scratch. In other words, you either reorganize the economy the way it's supposed to be, or the economy crashes and you rebuild everything from scratch. This is what happened to us, Bulgaria, in 1997. Since 1989, we had our, you know, communism collapsed, and the government's been printing and printing and printing. We ran budget deficits and all sorts of stupid stuff, and they made it from bad to worse, to the point where, for seven years, the economy is going down, inflation has been accelerated, and in 97, everything collapsed. The government went bankrupt, banks went bankrupt, everybody lost everything, unless they had some sort of a hard currency in their pocket. And you have to start rebuilding the government from scratch, rebuilding the banks from scratch, rebuilding the currency from scratch, and you start everything from the very beginning. That's for now the reason why the Bulgarian economy is so much more stable than other European economies. That's what Greece wants to do. <laughs> well, they, they, they don't want to do that. What, what we've been doing is we've been keeping our fiscal deficits extremely <coughs> low. And the reason is simple. We, just 10, 12, 15 years ago, the Bulgarian economy completely collapsed because the government was running huge deficits and it was understood by everybody that it was government deficits and government printing money that led to the ultimate collapse. We all know it. It's in our blood. We just lived through it. So we are keeping our deficits to the minimum. But not the French, not the Italians, not the Germans, not the rest of the world. Certainly not Japan, certainly not and the US. And where is most of their spending uh, hmm? gone there? When, uh, well, for the U.S., we know they're spending mostly on. Remember last time? No. What? Wars. First, paying people, killing other people, or warfare. They're spending most of their money on wars, and the other thing, paying people to do nothing. It's called welfare. So most of the U.S. government spends its money on. Welfare, we call it, they call it Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, and warfare, they call it Department of Defense. Okay, uh, I don't know, <laughs> it's not really Defense, Department of War. All right, so basically, where was I? So, ineffective monetary. Oh, these are the trends. Trends is number one. Rising central planning. I've actually copied this. You can probably zoom in up there. Mm -hmm. 2013 trends. I've copied this little article from uh, Charles Hugh Smith. What this guy sees for 2013. So he sees. I interrupt for a second because before you proceed, mm -hmm. following the Frederick's question. Okay. Okay. You say I mean, austerity is the way forward. Fine. I see your point. I didn't say the say forward. Yeah. No, the way forward. The only way. Whatever. No, no, no. The only healthy way. Yeah, okay. There's a right way and there's the wrong way. And governments will choose the wrong way. They'll never choose the right way to do it. Okay. <laughs> the, the only question in, in, in that respect, in my opinion, is it has also proved that uh, when you impose harsh austerity measures, right. take the example of Greece, right. There's no progress. I mean, the, the, what do you mean? The there's no progress. There's a big progress. Well, austerity means to cut costs, right, and be able to cover your costs with the revenues that the government has from taxes. Correct. Okay. The revenues, however, that come from taxes depend on the economic activity. Right. So, so if you overdo it with austerity measures, you correct. end up losing much more economic activity, and you and you go round and round and round, and in the meantime. Right. You just go down, the but spark. you are still owing 200% exactly. to GDP. Correct. Just uh, a note. So right, right, right. No, I, yeah, but, but I understand. Balance. Do we, we, cannot be yes, made. we have heard this, this, we've heard a thousand times. Like, every little child understands this, and every dumb politician understands this. But the alternative is sure to lead to complete disaster. 
Now, uh, we had similar stuff okay. in Iceland. Just because when you <coughs> shrink government spending, the economy shrinks, government revenue shrinks, doesn't mean that it's an endless spiral. It's a spiral with an end. So, you shrink spending by 20%, the economy shrinks by 10%, revenue shrink by 10%, okay? And now you shrink again by 10%. Again, the economy shrinks, the revenue shrinks, but you are, and what's gonna happen is government's gotta shrink two or three times. In other words, the problem is the Greek government is huge, over 50% of the economy. And by shrinking 20%, you decrease from 50 to 40. Is that good enough? Of course not. And when revenues shrink, they force the government to shrink from 40 to 32. But it's still not good enough. And it's got to shrink to 25 and maybe down to 20. So what this spiral is telling you is what is the sustainable level of government. And as long as revenue shrink, you gotta shrink the expenses too. Well, it's gonna lead to social collapse, but that's gonna happen okay. Okay. anyway, anyhow, guaranteed. So the question is this, do you do it voluntarily and under control, or you do it with a total chaos with the markets and revolution? So. It, that, that, that's the only, it's going to happen <coughs> anyway, so that's the question. But that means we have to do it earlier, and not wait. Ah, uh, uh, no, what, what I'm saying is different. If you do it earlier, it will be better for the people. Exactly. Correct. Then why do we accept the money politicians. they send us? Because politicians don't, Greek politicians, like with the Bulgarian and American and European, they don't care about the people. Politician cares about so themselves. Why the rest give the money? Saying then? Is if I understand it, we yeah. should stop accepting the money because we're celebrating. Ah, oh, we got the next, the other bailout. Oh it. no, we no. Should stop accepting the money. We are oh. out of euro and we start from the beginning. Yeah. Okay. And the sooner you okay. do it, the better. And then we agree. <laughs> and, 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 and here is yeah, something. Well, 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 but, but, no, no, no. Guys. And there is something else that's important, which is the experience of Iceland and default and stop paying and this is exactly what I, actually which is the most stable and the best growing economy in Europe today is Iceland not surprisingly this is what Iceland did exactly. it declared its own bankruptcy it stopped paying foreign countries it put it its corrupt bankers in jail some of the politicians are in jail they clean up the mess and they rebuild from scratch. And now they're stable and solidly who money, growing. Who gave the money to start all over again? You don't need much money or any money to start. You, 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 don't pay. you have <laughs> well, 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 okay. Okay. First of all, you don't need anyone's money to start. All you need is a fishing boat. Go catch the fish. Then you either eat and you're okay, or you sell the fish and get the money. Yeah, you, you know, you, 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 you still need to buy things overseas. You don't need to go back to 100 years to stuff on the beginning. Exactly. Well, look, it is when you don't have any debt, it's always easy to get a little bit <coughs> to start. You don't need trillions or hundreds of billions to get the economy started. Start. Start. It's a, look, a look, you're asking a question which we know the answer. Too many countries have gone bankrupt so many times in the history and they always restart and they're always doing okay so after you go through the bankruptcy the economy always stabilizes this happened in after the 1997 the asian financial crisis in 94 mexico had a crisis in 2002 argentina had a crisis so you always have a crisis you always have a collapse and the economy surprisingly <coughs> starts up. well how did we Bulgaria in 1997, complete collapse, and we did stuff. And what, 10 years later, we were a booming economy. Most people got BMW, Mercedes, everybody's got a mobile, many people got two mobiles. We still have 50% uh, hmm? poverty. 
just before. That's a whole different story. It's a recovery. It's a dead cat. It's a dead cat bounce that got the alive. Let's let, let's continue. Uh, let, let me finish for a few more minutes. No, no, then no, I have one uh, serious question. Here. Okay. Uh, if you got a serious have. question. No, no, listen. This, yes. this is interesting because okay. uh, something uh, of Australia, but I want to continue. Uh, this austerity measures. Okay. Mm -hmm. I also think that's the right way uh, to go. That's what family would do anyway. Yes, that's what family would do. That's what a business would do. That's yes. what anybody I, but politicians, uh, politicians yes. would do. Okay. Now, I have listened to a uh, Serbian uh, finance minister and I didn't know how to... Actually, I think it's crazy as well, but this is what the guy was saying. Uh, this is, I want to check with you if this makes sense. Uh -huh. And if somebody is pursuing the austerity measures correctly, uh -huh. would this would be one of the options available to them. What this guy was saying is, uh, we, in a year, we increased our debt by a couple of billion uh, euros in, uh, okay. in Serbia. And they accused him, because they only uh, took over recently this year, they accused him that they're building a national debt, public debt. Mm -hmm. He said, no, it's not true. The main debt was generating earlier. What we are doing now, okay, in order to keep uh, the system alive and everything, uh -huh. We are actually borrowing new debt. new debt at a much better interest rate, lower interest rate, uh -huh. which is helping us to repay the old debt. All debt. Okay, well, yeah, that, that's it's very simple. simple. It's very simple. This it's a slower build, build of, the, okay. of the same story. No, it, uh, well, it's the, the, the key question is very, very simple. It's called the net outstanding debt, the total outstanding debt. Is it going up or if it's not going up? What they do is usually the following dirty, nasty tricks. That's what politicians do, and that's how they lie. They borrow 10 billion at a lower interest rate, they pay down eight, and they use the extra two for spending money. Spending, right? That's what women do, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what <laughs> politicians do. So the point is, if they use the Full proceeds, it's called refinancing a loan. To refinance a loan means to issue a new loan and use the new money to pay the old debt. But that's not what they really do. What they really do is they take the new money, part of it they use to pay back, and the other part they use for fresh spending. No, but but yeah. they say that, oh, we are paying less on the loan because before we were paying 5%. Now we are paying 4%, so the interest payment is down 20%, but the principal is going up a little bit. All right, so, so they are essentially manipulating and basically lying. I don't know exactly what happened in Serbia in that particular but case. But that would be an opportunity. If you, if you are having strong austerity measures, you prove your credibility. Right. You would expect that you will get uh, better loans uh, at yes. lower rates. And if you use that money uh, appropriately, That's correct. you can speed up your recovery. <coughs> correct. So why yeah, only that stays hmm? when you declare bankruptcy, when a state declares bankruptcy. God. Right. What happens to the to the to All the that. to the creditors? Do they lose something or they they, they don't lose? They well, have the, they have okay. The Real bankruptcy means that creditors lose, lose lose most of their money. That's why Greece went three times bankrupt, but nothing happened because the creditors didn't lose the money. Creditors must lose money in a real bankruptcy so that you reduce the if you declare bankruptcy and the creditors don't lose money, you haven't done anything. Not Nothing. Yeah, but do they have a legal right to come after you after you recover? Well, 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 if well, I hold the government bonds and Greece goes bankrupt today. Right. Okay. And uh, what you, I don't accept any of the proposals, right. blah, blah, blah. Then I come back 10 years later when they are okay. Right. Like what is happening now with Argentina with some right. uh, funds that didn't accept the initial offer back in Right. Time. Well, what What's they, going on now in that? Okay, well, first of all, you got two completely different issues. One is the pure legal issue. What happens under the law and what happens under the law of bankruptcy, especially international. But it's completely different. What happens when you get corrupt politicians? They come to the politicians and say, look, I'm going to give you one billion in your pocket. If you're going to pay us back five billion and you're going to put it on the bill of your own people, 
You understand what I'm saying? This exactly looks happening. It, 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 they, they're, they're choosing a corrupt politician who will recognize the debt and will take it out. But usually in a classical bankruptcy, the government stops paying. Well, they kind of say what? They're going to send the military to collect the money? Yeah. Or, or mafia. Mean? Or mafia? What, what are they going to do? Usually what they do is they use it's called economic hitman. An economic hitman is the mafia of the IMF and the World Bank, and where the economic hitman says, look, you can get rich and all the other good stuff if you start paying us back so we can collect. And if not, we're going to send the jackal, okay? Yeah. And the jackal is going to... Assassinate. Yeah, assassinate you. And they're going to be done. And so, well, well, we can begin first with your daughter or wife or one of your loved ones, okay, and then we'll end up with you. So essentially that's what keeps them, but that's a completely different story, all right? Because now we're getting into politics, into mafia, into corruption, not the pure economics. But unless the debt load is lowered, you haven't done anything. And that's what happened with Greece. That's so why the creditors they have to accept something except for the well uh, uh, look, look, historically yeah. when France goes bankrupt. Creditors don't have a choice. What are you going to send the army to defeat France, or Russia goes bankrupt? What are you going to do? Send the German army in Russia? What are you going to do? Send the American army? What you're just going to invade Russia? Of course not. You can't invade Russia. If Britain goes bankrupt, who's going to go in a war to get it back? You see. So we got to understand when a government goes bankrupt. The key question is, can you send the military to collect or not? Uh -huh. And if it's the U.S., the U.S. can send. It's called the gunboat policy. A gunboat policy is where the British Navy, the British government, sends the Navy to that particular little country, I don't know, Cyprus, and say, we got, are going to destroy you completely. You pay us back. Okay? But you can't do it on a country like Japan or China, right? Well, the British did it back in the old days, but that's a different story. All right, let's get back to economics, because you're asking more legal questions. Just one, just one okay, more. Okay, one more. Do you know that these economic hitmen are the, the, the real story? There is a department in the mm -hmm. US government which is exactly dealing with these type of things? Going to destroy the, the economy of the country if uh, if it is yeah. not possible they shoot and they organize these jackals they go and they it, shoot and then finally you didn't know. All right, let, let, let's give a reference here. It's a little booklet. It's very nice. We can read. It's called Confessions of an Economic Hitman. You type it in Google. Confessions of an Economic Hitman. John Perkins. You're gonna get the whole story and all the details. Now back to the global the economy. The global. <laughs> and so I can finish for, for this time. All right, so number one, expect more government planning. Expect more central planning. That's happening in the U.S. It's happening in Europe. It's happening in France. It's happening in Japan. It's happening practically in the whole world. So whatever the trends are, it just keeps going from bad to worse. Number two, Expect more ineffective monetary policy. They're going to keep printing, and the only result will be more inflation. They won't be able to stimulate. Expect more ineffective fiscal policy. The governments will spend more money, and it won't have any effects. In other words, it's not going to help the jobs and job market in economics. Expect more ineffective market intervention. That's what's to expect. Expect that. 2013 will be the year where they're going to be a loss in confidence in central planners. In other words, people so far say, oh, government will never let this happen. Oh, government will fix it. People will begin in this year to wake up to the reality that governments are not almighty, that governments can't fix all problems, that governments are not the solution, you know, as Ronald Reagan said, government is the problem. Government is not the solution. So people are slowly beginning to wake up that no matter what the government's doing, it just gets worse. Government doesn't solve any problems. There will be a loss of confidence in the Fed, the Federal Reserve of the U.S. 
now this year is going to Christmas going to have be hundred years old and it has uh, you know the world has trusted the Federal Reserve to run the economy and the monetary policy well sooner very soon people one by one and governments one by one are going to be losing trusts in the efficiency, honesty, and integrity of the U.S. Federal Reserve. There is a massive loss of confidence in, what the hell is MSM? MSM. Mainstream media. People will wake up to the idea, which most of us have just always known, Mainstream media are an instrument of propaganda, right? Everybody knows that. Well, most people actually don't. Yeah. My father's just watching TV and doesn't worry. And we talk and say, oh, they said this and they said that and they. Well, who are they? Well, not realizing that it's just propaganda. And the bigger the TV, like the BBC, BBC is British Broadcasting Corporation, right? Well, what's the British Broadcasting Corporation? It is the official institution of British propaganda no British propaganda okay well right now which is the one of the biggest uh, institutions in the United States for American propaganda well, CNN. What's this? CNN. CNN in terms of newspapers is New York Times okay for the so people more and more people are waking up to the idea that these are truly manipulating people, that they disseminate only propaganda, and you read them at your risk, at your risk for your health, your finance, for your <laughs> life, and every, your freedom, and everything else. All right, there's going to be a loss of confidence in Keynesianism. Well, what is Keynesianism? Well, it is the belief that the government should run and control the economy with the tools of fiscal policy and monetary policy and people believe that politicians including an economist that oh the government can run a bigger deficit to stimulate the economy or, or, or you know or have more monetary policy more expansionary monetary policy to stimulate and people will begin to realize that these don't work okay you're not by drinking more and more alcohol you aren't going to get healthier and if you're an athlete, you're not going to be running faster. You're not going to be doing better. Okay? So, that, hmm? so what would help this effect? Well, people will help themselves. This is the problem. The problem today is that more, most people believe that the government will have to help. Okay? If you're sick, people believe what? The doctor's got to give you a magic pill, and the magic pill's going to get you healthy, right? No, no, I'm talking gonna... about the economic model. It will be complete laissez-faire liberalization. Yes, laissez-faire liberal type policy. Well, this is, the alternative is the interventionist model. Which it, is not working. Well, which is proven for decades to be a complete failure. Well, what I'm saying here is that people will realize this to be the case. You gotta understand, there are two different things between reality and what people think. For example, reality is that real estate goes up in bubbles and crashes after that. But people believe, for some reason, that real estate always goes up, all right? So, when the, the real estate crashes the first year, did people realize that real estate is going to go down and down? No, most people did not realize. After two, after three, after four years of real estate going down and down and down, people wake up to the idea that, oh, real estate is not the greatest of all investments, okay? So, usually, people realize about reality after a few years later. Of course, some people are too dumb. They you know, don't use their own brain and they have other problems, but most people, the majority of people, realize after two, after three, after five years. Well, like Hitler's Germany. Germans loved Hitler. They thought he was great. They chose him. They empowered him. They 
thought and believed that he was doing so much better and he was and it took so many years later for them to realize that they are locked down in a terrible military dictatorship all right so the point is people begin to understand about reality a few years later well same thing here Keynesianism had failed but people still believe well people will lose confidence in governments another thing expect more economic stagnation okay economy expect permanent adolescence you're going to tell us if this happens in Greece permanent adolescence is a phenomenon which is well established culturally in Japan old men and Japanese understand it and women young men and women and girls live it what's permanent adolescence it is young men in their 20s and maybe 30s living with mom and dad and mom and dad pays for the electricity and water permanent adolescence is a result of bad economy poor economy poor job opportunities where young men cannot get in their late 30s a good well-paying job so they can borrow or buy themselves a house so permanent adolescence is a result of young people who grow up in a poor economy where they instead of making a corporate career making money being a house and everything they prefer to live with mom and dad on very very little money you don't have to have a job you don't have to work hard you get the occasional job you don't have to buy a car you don't have to buy anything you know mom's gonna pay for the electricity and for the food well that for the last 20 years has been the reality of Japan it is becoming the reality of Greece I would understand many people are moving back with their parents it is a steady trend in the United States where more and more college graduates they graduate from college they got debt and they just return to live with mom and dad they don't buy a car they use mom and dad car when they need it okay they don't get a real job and they have part-time job and stuff like that. so this is a pure social phenomenon which reflects a terrible economy next one falling real incomes falling real incomes is the same as falling standard of living falling real incomes means your salary buys less yeah your salary may go up two percent but inflation goes up 15 percent and you lose 13 percent on your salary so you buy less bread less milk less cheese less coke less everything falling real incomes means that the standard of living will be falling that the country will be growing poorer you have a decline of small business that's a major trend it's practically everywhere in the US it's practically in Japan like that it's in most of Europe like that is it also in Greece like that and yeah. my understanding we have it right here in Bulgaria the same thing most of the small businesses can't survive reason number one you can zoom in big time globalization they have to compete with bigger and bigger competitors than our Walmart and whatever it's here and all those international big chains Carrefour here in Bulgaria right it's difficult to compare number one uncertainty it's not that uh, small businesses are at a disadvantage with uncertainty it's that big corporations have better capacity to buy so what's a small business just one or two guys running a little shop in there they don't understand about uncertainty they don't have a business degree but about corporation well corporate CEO will have one degree maybe an MBA maybe another degree he will have 15 20 years of experience okay in probably many different countries so a CEO or corporate executive is very well educated and very well experienced you don't get a CEO at 28 do you no not really right 
Uh, usually, you know, CEO <coughs> is usually at 20, 25, 30 years of experience, maybe in two, three, five different countries, okay? So, a CEO is very well equipped to deal with uncertainty. He yeah, knows it. They are looking for he understands it. But a small businessman doesn't read. I mean, small businessman wouldn't understand what happened. A CEO gets to understand the big picture. Another one is recession. Major corporations are better able to handle recessions, okay? And another one, over taxation. Major corporations are able to go around and not pay as much taxes, or they can have a political influence to change the tax system to favor major corporations at the expense of smaller business. In the US, this is proven. The bigger the corporation, the smaller share it pays, smaller taxes it pays. They also got a whole bunch of subsidies and a whole bunch of other things. Well, same thing is practically in Japan, for sure, is like that. And I think probably even in Bulgaria is like that. In Europe, I know, in Germany, France is like that. Most corporations have relatively smaller taxes because they got a favorable tax treatment, which small businesses don't get. And the last one is over regulation. As long as you have major regulation, corporations have a few or an army of lawyers to deal with that, and small businesses don't. Okay, hiring a lawyer to deal with regulatory problems is usually a big problem. It's going to drive a small businessman into bankruptcy. Basically, means that the decline of small business, all of these will necessarily lead to more bankruptcies of smaller businesses and the relative survival and growth of large corporations. And the last one's going to be rising territorial disputes. And rising territorial disputes, we see them all over the world. So, what is a gray swan? 2013 gray swan. A gray swan is an event which is unexpected. Well, you could possibly Guess, but not really. Gray swan is actually what they call, is, the original term is called a black swan. And a black swan is a totally and completely unpredictable, like the unknown unknown. Well, here we got a few that we could possibly guess about. And if you could possibly guess about it, it's not a black swan. So we've coined a new term called a, what is it, a gray swan. Well, what could happen? Well, the Eurozone could collapse. That should be expected, okay? Could very likely happen. Could be triggered by Greece leaving, by Spain defaulting or leaving. Another black swan, oh sorry, gray swan is war with Iran. I mean, for so many years, America and all the other countries are, you know, have this thing going on with Iran. It's been building and building and building. Well, we might finally get to a war. Well, what's the war have to do with the economy? Uncertainty, risk, oil markets. All we need is a little bit of shooting so that the oil price shoots 20, 30, 50% up, and that's going to crash probably the whole global economy, okay? Except the Arab countries, right? Which are the oil exporting countries. Another one to watch for is Japan. Japan could have, it could be a fiscal crisis. They could have a market panic. Another one is skyrocketing oil prices, not necessarily because of war with Iran, could be a whole bunch of other reasons. Another one could be skyrocketing inflation. Another one could be skyrocketing interest. What does it mean skyrocketing interest rates? It means most governments will not be able to finance themselves. A different way of saying it is next one. Rising interest rates is the same as the bursting global bond bubble is the same as collapsing bond markets. This means a lot of banks who invested in bonds will go bankrupt. A lot of pension funds and mutual funds who have invested in these bonds will get in trouble. In other words, the whole global financial system is going to get in big trouble. Another one most likely will be resolved, but nevertheless is the U.S. debt ceiling. You never know. These are politicians. They are like children. It may lead to a bond crisis, U.S. bond crisis, and it may lead to funding crisis. Funding crisis means inability of the government to issue new debt 
in order to pay its bills. And it can get in serious trouble very quickly. That's coming within two months. Another one is a true, genuine deleveraging. When the economy is deleveraging, which means lowering risk, usually markets crash. And if stock market crash or bond market crash, a whole other terrible things happen. Another one is France. France is going down. It could be in 2013, more likely 2014. Very difficult to forecast when, but it could be sooner than we all think. So, explain. What is this? Fishing boats to gunboats. What's a gunboat? Fishing boats to gunboats. War boats. Huh? Yeah, war boats. So, what am I talking about here? Huh? Yes, which conflict? Uh, fishing conflict. Yeah, all, no. the, all of the resources. But which ones? Where? I'm talking about specific one right now. Fish. Yes, we, no, no, no. Which country? Which islands? Huh? Called the Senkaku Islands. Japan. This is the current conflict between China and Japan over a specific set of islands known in Japanese and the Senkaku Islands, which each country claims to be there's in each country ready to go to war. Now, war between Japan and China is going to be a complete global disaster. That's now, would it happen? I'm not saying it will, but it's a possibility to watch for. This is one of the global developments to be aware. You never know what these politicians will do, okay? And another one could be something like SARS-2. You could just get a global virus. I mean, viruses are all here. You can always get another infection that will be a global. And what is this? Super weeds. What the hell is super weeds? What's super weeds having? What's a weed? Yeah? Plano. Plano. So, what does it mean? So, a weed is, you got agricultural food, like rice or rye or whatever, corn, and you got weeds. These are other, you know, uh, plants oh. which usually That's prevent you from growing, okay? Oh. So, you want to get rid of them. Well, what's this super weed? You know what? You didn't say what super weed. It's a GMO, you know what's genetically modified foods and genetically modified organism. These are special, you know, defined, but de de developed by Monsanto, okay, which Monsanto grows. You spray them with Roundup, when you spray them with Roundup, everything else dies except your plant, okay? Well, what's a super weed? A super weed is a weed which after so many years of spraying with Monsanto's Roundup, they become Roundup resistant. When you spray them, they don't die. And if they don't die, they eat alive the crop. They eat the crop. Or super bugs. Okay, you spray with a pesticide and the bugs don't die. What's this got to do with anything? What's the connection? Control. Ah, it could, we could face a major food crisis. So, if you develop a major super weed or a super weeds, you could have a major global food crisis, major food shortages, and food shortages lead, number one, skyrocketing food prices, number two, hunger, starvation, and a whole bunch of revolutions, okay? The revolution in, uh, in Egypt did not start about, you know, it started about food inflation. So in many poor countries, you can get easily, quickly, a super weed, the result is a revolution around the world, maybe in many countries around the world. All right, let's see, I'm still trying to finish over here. Okay, this is for you to see a little later, is geopolitical hotspots in 2013. Let's just go very quickly. Uh, you can actually read and you can zoom in here. Number one, US strategy can change from the Middle East to Asia Pacific and with a whole bunch of complications. I mean, that's geopolitics, which I don't want to discuss now. Number two, you can also see Venezuela, leadership change with likely amid Chavez. You know, Hugo Chavez got health problems. He's suffering from cancer and all the other. When it's changed, 
God knows what happens again. Argentina, another political instability, social unrest, maybe revolution, deteriorating economy. In other words, Argentina is in yet another major crisis, and God knows what happens. Again, another major uncertainty. You got a whole bunch of things going in Africa, Mali. You got rising extremism. You got war going on in the last two weeks. Actually, the French got in there, now the rebels are. So this is becoming a big and very complicated war. And wars have lots of unintended consequences. Nigeria and Libya has rising extremism. South Africa has got an overall political and economic instability. Okay, you can move on to Germany and Italy. They got crucial elections. God knows what happens in these elections. Of course, uh, they don't have here uh, uh, Italy, Greece. Uh, you, you, you can get a whole bunch of other problems over there. Iran, you got elections in June. You got nuclear stuff. You could get into war. Iran is very complicated geopolitically. Syria, well, it's in the midst of a like civil war, but also, you know, Syria. God knows what happened because it's in the middle and a whole bunch of other stuff. Too complicated and you just don't know. Another one is Egypt. Well, they had a revolution two years ago and their local revolution still keeps going and burning and they have a change and then doesn't work and have another change and now revolution again. I was two years ago in Bahrain and I was there uh, while you had this Bahrainian revolution you know, you walk on the next day, and they got a lot of blood on the street. They didn't have the time to wash it, all right? I mean, you get lots of shootings and stuff like that. You know, of course, they declared peace by putting a tank with, you know, machine guns on every road cross. Every road, you got a machine, you know, tank with a machine gun, and it's called peace. Next one, Israel. A lot of tension with Iran, Palestine, and a whole bunch of other things. China and Japan, they got, you know, lots of, you know, they got the new governments, so what are they going to do in the economy? We don't know. China government is changing. They are now got problems with their territories. North Korea, internal instability and risk. So the world is a very risky place. And my last one is, what are the executive recommendations? So. You're all executives of a firm or of different branches of a firm or whatever. What you should be doing in this type of environment? And the short answer is exactly the opposite of what you have been doing during the boom. So remember the good years of 2005, 6, and 7, and 8? Now you do the exact opposite. So number one, the strategy is consolidation and survival. Consolidation mean whatever is not making a profit, get rid of it, sell it, okay? Employees not working well, fire them, okay? Recapitalize and restructure. What does it mean, recapitalize? <laughs> recapitalize means you issue usually more equity and pay down debt. Bankruptcy essentially means inability to meet obligations. Okay, so if you don't have obligations and if you don't have debt, you can't really go bankrupt. Yeah, you could still have an obligation to pay a salary, but you can do that by cutting the labor, all right? You still may have an obligation to pay electricity, but these are the small bills. So, you Recapitalize. You reduce your debt as much as you can, all right? And you restructure. Restructure again. You can swap debt for equity so you can reduce your debt and whatever business you need to do. Profits. If you have a business profits, what do you do with profits? What's the better way to use profits? Back in the old days, you use profits to grow the business. You reinvest them to grow the business. Now, you use the profits to pay down debt. Pay down debt. Paying down debt is called deleveraging. To deleverage 
Leverage means to use more debt. To deleverage means to reduce the debt. So in this particular case, use profit to reduce the debt and you increase your cash position. So if you get a profit and you convert it because profits usually come in cash, right? You either pay down debt or just keep it in cash, okay? Instead of investing. So it's actually what I'm saying is, guys, it's not a good idea to invest these days. If you got a profit, keep it or pay down debt. Another one, which is the same as this one, deleverage. Use whatever means necessary to lower your debt. One major strategy in an environment like this is called divestiture. To divest is the opposite of invest. Invest means to acquire productive assets. To divest means to sell those assets. So if you got six lines of business and one or two businesses are not working, you sell that piece of business, use the cash to pay down debt. Okay? You don't have that business, you sell it out, and you, you got that real estate or whatever property which you don't use, sell it, get the cash, pay down debt. All right, risk is associated with debt. And the strategy should be to use whatever resources you have and focus on paying down the debt as fast as you can. All right, you diversify, what do you mean to diversify cash? Well, you're an international company. Some money you keep in Bulgaria, but Bulgarian banking system can go down. I'm not saying it will. You keep some in Slovenia. You keep none in Greece. <laughs> uh, no, you keep some uh, well, in Switzerland. You keep some in Germany. You keep some in Cyprus. Cyprus. You keep some in Israel. You keep some in... Money, but tip your bank. <laughs> You keep some in Israel, you keep some in Russia, okay, you may keep some in Britain. So you try to diversify your cash holdings. But ideally, you shouldn't be holding too much cash. Cash. If you got too much cash, use it to pay down debt. Can I ask something? This yes, of course. This applies also for uh, private uh, individuals. Yes, and for families, right? Of course. <laughs> you got to pay down your debt. So the moment there are some savings, you pay back your loan. Yes, if you believe that eventually you're going to be able to pay down completely. Because if you have a house, you owe a quarter of a million euro, you can never pay the house. Why keep paying for the house if you'll never be able to pay it again? You understand? Yes, yes. You keep paying as long as you have the expectation that you're going to be able to pay out or pay yeah, off. If the banks are going to collapse, uh, why? Uh, I mean, it's, it's like a good strategy to have loans. Okay, okay, that's I heard a thousand times, and I don't know why Bulgarians keep thinking that if the bank